tempted and tried, we know all about it. Why it should be thus all the day long. Gloom and despair, <laughs> agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. Nobody likes discipline. None at all. Even though we know that joy comes in the morning, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, we still don't like going through the night. I will never forget growing up and watching Hee Haw and seeing the cold hands on that front porch. That, that is an image that I think probably 10 million years into eternity, I'll still see them sitting there saying gloom, despair, and agony on me. And folks, so many times that's how we feel. And, and in reality, that's what Psalm chapter 30, and that, that's where we're going to be this morning. In reality, that's what Psalm chapter 30 is about. It's about being disciplined. It's about being in the hand of the Lord and allowing him to work through our lives and bring about his purposes. And it contains one of the most often quoted verses in the Bible, but we often don't realize that what he is actually talking about is God's hand of discipline upon him. So let's read this, and then we'll, we'll take a minute and we'll look at it. And he begins by saying, I will exalt you, Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not allowed my enemies to triumph over me. Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me. Lord, you brought me up from Sheol. You spared me from among those going down to the pit. Sing to the Lord, you his faithful ones, and praise his holy name. And then verse 5 is the one we're going to focus on. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor a lifetime. Weeping may stay overnight, but there is joy in the morning. When I was secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you showed your favor, you made me stand like a strong mountain. When you hid your face, I was terrified. Lord, I called to you and I sought your favor from my Lord. What gain is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your truth? Lord, listen and be gracious to me. Lord, be my helper. You turned my lament into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness so that I can sing to you and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. Father, help us to see the import of your hand. Father, of your grace in our lives, but also not of just your blessing, but your discipline. Father, how that you would have us to learn and to grow from that. Amen. So the first thing that I see when I begin to study this text, and in particular in verse 5, is I notice that it has to do with discipline. And most of the time, that's not the way that we actually look at it or that we quote this verse or what we mean when we quote this verse. Look at what it says, the first half of the verse when I read that just a while ago, how many of you even knew that there was a first half to that verse? All we knew is joy comes in the morning. That, that's basically all we knew. But there's a first half, and the first half says, for his anger, oh, for his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favor for a lifetime. So what is his anger? What, what is he talking about? What's he comparing here? Because when he says that, he says, Lord, your anger, obviously, with him, lasts only for a moment, but your favor for a lifetime. Weeping, his anger, that causes weeping, may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. For a child of God, his anger is his discipline. His anger is his hand upon us to, to 
help us to grow, to bring us back into his path and into the way that he would have us to walk. And according to the psalmist, in comparison, his anger only lasts for a moment, but his blessing lasts for a lifetime or salvation and eternity. So that's the way we need to look at it and compare the anger of the Lord, the discipline of the Lord, compare that with that being the nighttime, but his blessing, his joy being the morning and that being for all eternity. In John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, the Lord promises us that he will prune us, or if you would, that he would discipline us. Now, that's the passage. You'll remember that the Lord says, I am the vine, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. And he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, you remember what he does? He, prunes, he cuts them off. And later on, he says that all their worth is to be thrown over to the side, when they're dried, gathered up, thrown into the fire, used for firewood. But he said those that bear fruit, he prunes them, he trims them back. He helps them to be healthy so that they can bear more fruit. Now, just the thought of pruning, that brings pain because what does pruning do? Even the good pruning of the good branches is still cutting something off. So it's still suffering to an extent. It's still going through something that would bring about pain, that would bring about anguish for a moment. And again, no one likes discipline. Not even if it's a discipline that we are trying to self-discipline ourselves. And I mean, that's pretty obvious. For example, you go to the doctor and the doctor says, look, you've got this this particular health issue. And the only way to fix this is to either get on a regimen of medicine, which most of us do not really want to do. He says, or you can change your eating habits. Everything that you love to eat, everything that is just so delicious, and you can just sit down and just eat and eat and eat, you got to stop. And everything that you would put in your mouth that would make your face go like that and that is terrible that's what you need to eat okay well your choice is discipline yourself to eat all of this junk tasteless worthless food or die get worse and worse in your health condition until you die how many of us how many of us honestly even under the thought of death, ever stick to that diet? Maybe one or two. You know why I look like I do? Discipline. Discipline. How many times do you think I've started an exercise program? I'm going to lose this gut. I am going to get in shape. I'm going to be healthy. I'm tired of being out of breath, just walking up the boat ramp. So when I get home, I'm going to exercise. You think I did it? Well, obviously not. Why not? Discipline. Nobody likes discipline. It always entails some kind of change. It always entails making ourselves do something that we didn't want to do in the first place. Had we wanted to do it in the first place, it wouldn't have been discipline. I don't have to discipline myself to go to the lake. I don't have to discipline myself to get up in the middle of the night and go find the ice cream in the freezer. No discipline involved. I have to discipline myself to make myself do the things that I need to do. And when God brings discipline into our lives, folks, it's no different. The discipline of the Lord, as we're going to see in just a few minutes, is painful. 
It, it's a form of suffering. It's something that God does in our lives to bring us to a place that he wants us to be. But for us to get from here to there, sometimes we have to go through the, the pruning process. Sometimes we have to go through, as Jesus would say, dying to ourselves daily so that we can get where we're supposed to be. But listen to what the psalmist also says about discipline in Psalm 119, beginning in verse 67 and reading verse 67 and 68. He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and you do what is good. Teach me your statutes. Did you hear that? Before I was afflicted or disciplined, I went astray. But now, since you disciplined me, since you worked in my life and pruned some things away, now I know how to do the right thing. And then he says in verse 71, he says, Lord, it was good for me to be afflicted so I could learn your statutes. Now, folks, that's a hard thing to say. Even if it's true and you've come through that, that's a difficult thing to say. But go back to our text and see what else he has to say. And this will help us to understand that we need discipline. And keep this thought in mind, okay, as we finish up this message. Keep this thought in mind. Not all discipline is because we've done something wrong, okay? Just because God is working in your life to bring about changes, to help you to be pruned and lose something, does not necessarily mean that you've done something wrong. It may simply be the hand of God at work in your life to help you grow up, to help you become mature, and to help you become complete. Notice what the psalmist says. Just drop down to verse 6, beginning with that verse. He says, when I was secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Amen. <laughs> Everything's going good. The Lord's blessing me. I'm a pillar of faith. Just ask me. Because everything is going so good. When it was all going my way, I was fine. But then verse 7 comes along. Notice what he says in verse 7. He said, Lord, when you showed me your favor, you made me strong like a mountain. But when you hid your face, I was terrified. I started to bring a yo-yo to this message. And sometimes I wish I would have. When you're doing that yo-yo, it's up and down, up and down. And that's the way most of us are. Oh, the Lord, I'm, I'm in favor with the Lord. The Lord's blessing me. Everything's going great. Just, just ask me. I, I, I'm, I'm trusting the Lord. And then the Lord puts his hand on us. Remember, that's what we're talking about. Because what did he say in verse 5? He said his anger lasts for a moment. God's discipline. And he even says it in verse 7 that it's like when the Lord hides his face from us. All of a sudden now we're going through life and we feel like, wait a minute. God, where'd you go? Why is this happening? We begin to feel alone. We begin to feel abandoned. And all it is is God's discipline. But do you see the change in verse 7? He went from being a mountain of faith and praise to what? Terrified terrified. We're not supposed to be that way. That's that yo-yo. Up and down. Up and down. One day I'm faithful, the next day I'm terrified. One day I'm faithful, the next day I'm terrified. Folks, it shouldn't be that way. And we're going to see in just a minute in verses 1 through 4 how we should be. Mature. Complete. It's maturity that we need. And it's maturity that we don't get on a Sunday afternoon picnic. You're not going to get it sitting in church. You're going to get the principle of it. You're going to get the understanding of it, but you're not going to grow and get it in here. Listen to what James says. He says, consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect 
so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So what the Lord is after in our lives is that we be mature Christians, we be complete. Some of your translations say perfect. I have no problem with that as long as you understand what perfection is. Perfection means having what you need. Complete is a better word. And what he wants is, is that instead of your life being like that yo-yo, your life is like this. Now, I wanted the yo-yo to do that one where you flip it out and back and forth like that. And I thought, sure as I do that, that thing will come off the string and go out there and bop somebody, Brother Jim, in the head, and then we'd have a problem. That's the way we as Christians are supposed to be. Level. Complete. Mature. So even on the days when God is blessing us, on the days that we feel like we're on the mountaintop, on the days when we feel like the Lord has hid his face from us, on the days that his hand of discipline is upon us, we can still stand up and say, you know what? I'm trusting him. I'm walking with him. I'm going to let him have his work. Go as far as James says, brethren, count it pure joy when you fall into various trials and temptations. Could you see somebody sitting up on that front court with the coal hangs and them with their long faces and all their sadness and somebody sitting there just as content? Maybe not a big old grin on their face, but just as content and happy as can be because they know that it's not gloom, despair, and agony on me. They know that it's the Lord at work in their life. And so they're going to endure and let the Lord do what he needs to do and what he wants to do. Notice verse 8 through 10. He said, Lord, I called to you and I saw favor from my Lord. What gain is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your truth? Verse 10, Lord, listen and be gracious to me. And then I like this last phrase, Lord, be my help. After he's been through these ups and downs, after he's realized that one day he's saying, I'm a, a mountain of faith and praise, and the next day I'm terrified, he's come to the point where now he realizes, Lord, without you, I can do nothing. Lord, I need you, whether I'm on the mountaintop, whether everything's going perfectly, or whether I'm down in the deepest, darkest valley of trial and tribulation, Lord, I need you. What did he say? Lord, be my help. And isn't that what Jesus said in John chapter 15? When you read down through that passage about the pruning and you come to verse 5, doesn't he say, without me, you can do nothing? Turn to Hebrews chapter 12 if you're following along with your scripture. Let's begin reading in verse 5. And the writer of the book of Hebrews has this to say. He says, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he punishes every son he receives. Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons, for what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you were without discipline, which we all receive, he says, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So if the Lord is not disciplining you, if you don't have times in your life where you're, you feel like you, you feel like he's hid his face from you, you feel like you're abandoned, the writer says, then you're not his son. You're illegitimate because he is going to discipline his children. And so he goes on and he says, furthermore, we had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the father of spirits and live? 
for they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them, but he does it for our benefit so that we can share his holiness. Verse 11, no discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Joy comes in the morning. But to get to the morning, you have to go through the night. To get to that place of joy, to get to that place where the Lord is leading you, where you are complete where you are mature. And look what they add here at the book of Hebrews at the end of verse 10. But he does it for our benefit so that we can share in his what? Holiness. So that we can be complete like him. That's what his purpose is. That's what he's doing. And then again, verse 11, because it's so important that we understand this. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time. Christian standard uses these two words, but painful. And I point you back to the pruning. Even though what the Lord is doing, you know it's for your good. You know it so you can bear more fruit, so you can grow and be more spiritual. What is it? It's painful. It's something that we have to go through that we don't want to, but we have to keep remembering there is a purpose. And we have to keep remembering that joy comes in the morning. We're going to go through this, but it's not going to last forever. Remember what he said before. He said, the anger of the Lord is but for a moment, but his favor is for how long? A lifetime. The judgment of God that comes upon us at the cross of Calvary, when we feel that guilt, when we feel that anguish over our sin, and when we understand what Jesus did, that's only for a moment in time. But when we repent and we receive the salvation of Jesus Christ by faith, how long is that? Eternity. So in our hearts and in our lives, when the Lord works, it may seem like it's a nighttime. But folks, in reality, joy comes in the morning. It's only for a moment. Back in our text, verse 11 and 12, now he can truly praise the Lord. Look what he says. He said, you turned my lament into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness so that I can sing to you and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. Now he's grown up. Now he understands that God is at work in his life. So now we can go back to verses 1 through 4 and see what it is when we are faithful and we're not up and down anymore. Listen to what he says again. He says, I will exalt you, Lord, because you have lifted me up and you have not allowed my enemies to triumph over me. Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you healed me. Lord, you brought me up from Sheol. You spared me from among the those going down to the pit. And then verse 4, sing to the Lord, you his faithful ones, and praise his holy name. So you see in verse 1 through 4, he again, he goes through everything that he went through in the rest of the chapter. But in the rest of the chapter, one minute he's up here, the next minute he's down here terrified. In verses 1 through 4, he says, now, Lord, he said, I see your hand. I see what you're doing. You delivered me from enemies. Well, how did the enemies get there? The Lord brought them in for discipline. He said, you healed me. Well, how did the sickness get there? The Lord brought it in for discipline. And he says, I came through all of those things 
In verse 4, he said, now I will sing with your faithful ones. Why? Because now he is complete. Now he is mature. Now he understands that what God is doing may terrify him for the moment, may seem like darkness, may seem like forever, but it's only for a moment. And joy comes in the morning. Know this, no matter what you're facing, and, and I mean that, no matter what, as in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we know that all things. So no matter what you are facing, if you will trust the Lord, and if you will hold on to his promise, joy will come in the morning. You won't have to endure this forever. You won't have to endure the things that God allows in your life because his anger only lasts a moment. But his favor is for a lifetime, yea, even for eternity. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to his blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye, and now that we're complete, now that we're mature, We'll follow till we die. And we'll understand it better by and by. Amen.